I'm using question 1713 to review some of the consolidation worksheet entries required when um, preparing consolidated financial statements. Now before we look at the question, just some exam technique on um, answering a integrated question or a longer question like um, the consolidation questions. The starting point should always be to read the required of the question. We need to know what is asked in the question so that when we start to read through the scenario and the information provided in the question, we know what to be on the um, lookout for. So if we read this, um, the required to this question, um, question 1713, it asks us to prepare the consolidated financial statement as at 31 December 2014. Okay, so we this is our financial year end, and we need to consider the consolidate um, to prepare the consolidated financial statements. Now, in this video clip, I'm not going to prepare the consolidated financial statements. I'm merely going to look at the consolidation worksheet entries. The next step is then to um, maybe scan through the question, see what kind of information is provided so we, um, we can identify the acquisition date, um, we see that the trial balances of both companies um, are given to us and then additional information is given. So maybe quickly just scan that to familiarize yourself with the type of information contained in the scenario. Now I'm quite keen on using timelines to organize the information um, given in the question. It's a personal preference on my side. Um, and I find it quite handy to, to get an overall picture of the question. Um, it's up to you what technique you're using. But what you basically want to do is to identify all the key transactions, all the important transactions and the important bits of information. So that when you start to answer the question, you don't overlook um, critical or crucial information. Okay, and then you start off with your entries or answering the question. Now we know this question is about consolidation, so um, maybe refer to the consolidation process consisting first of all of um, the acquisition analysis calculation. The purpose of that, of course, is to determine whether there's goodwill acquired in the business combination or whether the business combination was um, was done at a bargain, in which case we have to record again on a bargain purchase. Then we deal with the um, pre-acquisition equity um, that consists of two legs. First of all, revaluation of assets to the fair value, um, identifiable assets and liabilities of the subsidiary, and then the other leg where we um, eliminate the parent company's share of the su um, subsidiary's equity. And depending on the type of the question, we'll then carry on with the NCI calculation that's not applicable on this question and thereof to the elimination of intra-group transactions. And oh, there is some in this example. Okay, intergroup transactions. Uh, my advice would be to attempt a consolidation question under these um, headings or in these sections. So first of all, deal with the acquisition analysis um, until you've done the goodwill calculation then deal with all the BCVR entries, then the elimination of the parent company share of the subsidiary's equity, and um, lastly then with intergroup transactions relevant to the current financial year. Perhaps it would be a good time now to read through the question in detail, 
draw up a timeline if you want to use that or whatever structure works for you to identify all the relevant information before you continue with this video clip because I'm basically just going to start to look at um, the acquisition analysis and then the consolidation entries required um, to, for the consolidation worksheet. Okay, so the first step in the consolidation process is to um, draw up the acquisition analysis. The purpose, of course, to calculate whether there's any goodwill acquired in the business combination or whether it was again at a bargain purchase. How do we do the calculation? Um, the accounting statement says that when we um, acquire, a, when there's a business combination, the assets acquired and the liabilities assumed um, should be brought into the, um, the, uh, the results of the acquirer at fair value. So the first thing that we need to do is to calculate the net assets of the subsidiary um, valued at fair value. Now there's two ways that you can do it and it depends on the information given in the question. First of all you can be given the fair value of the identifiable assets and liabilities. You add that together to get um, the fair value of the the net fair value of the assets acquired. The second approach, which is more common in the consolidation questions, is that you are given the equity of the subsidiary at acquisition date, which of course is equal to the net asset value of the subsidiary at carrying amounts on the acquisition date. We can use this figure then, make adjustments for the assets not valued at fair value and that will in the end give us the net assets um, of the subsidiary at fair value. Okay, so let's do the acquisition analysis for this question. Okay, so we were given the equity of the subsidiary. So the share capital we were told is 200,000 shares paid to 50 cents a share, so that's $100,000. Other reserves and retained earnings at the acquisition date, of course, maybe just make a note of that. The acquisition date is the 31st of December 2009. Okay, um, is the general reserve of $25,000 and retained earnings $20,000. Okay, so what is that, 100 and? 45. Okay, so that's equal to the net asset values at carrying amount. Um, just think in terms of the balance sheet um, to, to understand why it's this. The balance sheet assets equals equity plus liabilities. So equity equals asset less liability, which is equal to the net asset value. Okay, at carrying amount. Further to that, we are told that on the acquisition date, all the identifiable assets and liabilities of Jade, which is the subsidiary, were recorded at fair value, except for some plants and machinery. The plant and machinery, which cost, um, so for the plant and machinery, the cost was $100,000. Um, it had a carrying amount of $85,000, so you can just see uh, the accumulated depreciation being $15,000. And it had a fair value 
of $90,000. So we need a $5,000 fee value adjustment after tax, which is um, three and a half thousand dollars. So that gives us a hundred forty-eight. Five hundred is the fee value of the net assets of the subsidiary on acquisition date. Okay. So what do we compare that to to see whether there's goodwill acquired um, through this business combination? We of course look at how much we've paid for um, this investment, so the consideration transferred. So the net fee value of the assets and liabilities we've calculated now is 148500 So let's see where we get information about the consideration transferred. Um, Immediately after, okay, that's the dividend, general reserve, and, okay. The consideration transferred can actually be identified in the trial balance. Because in the trial balance, under Laura Limited, Laura being the parent company who made the acquisition, um, there is an item, shares in Jade. So that is the investment in Laura's accounts. We would have made an investment. Debit shares in Jade um, Credit Bank for $160,000. So that equals the consideration that was transferred. Now you know from later questions, we also need to consider whether this consideration transferred is... Um, also includes a portion applicable to um, our share of the dividends that were declared at financial year end. So if we bought the right to those dividends as well, we um, say the acquisition was made cum diff, and then we had to adjust for that right to the dividend year. But in this question, there weren't any information on that. So we got... Um, through the business acquisition, assets and liabilities valued at fair value being one forty eight five hundred, we were willing to pay one hundred and sixty thousand dollars for it, so we paid a premium of eleven thousand five hundred, which will be recorded as goodwill. Okay, so this goodwill amount is only recorded. On consolidation, so it only exists in the consolidation consolidated financial statements. So it's not recorded in the accounting records of the subsidiary or of the parents. At this stage, also just note the comment that is made in the initial information that adjustments for fair values are made on consolidation. So that just basically tells that the fair value adjustment is made in the acquisition analysis and we've got a BCVR entry for it. Um, the alternative would be where it, the adjustments are made in the subsidiaries accounts, in which case there will be no BCVR entries. The second step would then be to start dealing with the pre-acquisition equity, which consists of two legs. First of all, the BCVR entries. Now, the BCVR entries relate to the revaluation on a group level of the assets acquired um, from the subsidiary um, or the assets acquired in the subsidiary where the carrying amount of the asset in the subsidiary differs from the fair value of that asset on acquisition date. So in this example, the only asset that we revalued was the, um, what was it, a plant, plant and machinery. So plant and machinery. There can also be um, inventory that might have been adjusted, vehicles um, and 
assets to that nature. But in this example, only the one asset being plant and machinery. We were also told that on the date of acquisition, this plant and machinery had a further useful life of 10 years. Now when this revaluation is done by the group, we record the fact that we expect um, future profits to be realized um, or that the, the asset um, holds more future profits um, or con uh, yeah, basically holds more um, future profits than the value that is recorded in the subsidiaries account. So from a group level, we basically record those future profits on the day that we do the revaluation. The higher profits will only flow through to the subsidiaries accounts when that asset is used and more sales um, perhaps are generated from using that asset. So over the next 10 years, that fair value adjustment um, on a group level will be reflected in a adjustment to the depreciation expense. And I'll look at that now um, with regards to this specific asset item. Okay, so when we've got a depreciable asset like this example, plants and machinery, and um, we're not drawing up the initial consolidation worksheet on the acquisition date, but we do a subsequent one. Like in this case, what did I say? It's 2009. Um, so it's about, and we're doing it for 2013, 2014. Let me just see quickly. Yeah, December 2014, so it's almost five years later. Um, then there will be three components to that depreciable asset when we pass the BCBR entry. First of all, the original valuation, adjusting the value of this asset to the fair value at acquisition date, also recording a deferred tax liability as a result, and the BCBR reserve. Second component would be to adjust the depreciation expense so that the depreciation expense is in line with the value of that asset on a group level. Because of course this asset is lying in the subsidiaries accounts and they're going to depreciate it based on the cost to them of that asset. So the depreciation expense flowing through from the subsidiary will be different than what it should be on a group level because the value at which that asset is included in the financial statements differ from the su subsidiary's um, accounting records to what it should be on a group level. And as we record that extra depreciation or as we adjust the depreciation expense, the deferred tax is reversed. Okay, so when you deal with the BCVR entries of a depreciable asset, always remember that you should cover three sets of adjustments, the valuation, the depreciation, and the tax effect of the depreciation. So check yourself when you do it. Okay, now let's see if we can fit everything here on the same page. So our valuation adjustment, first of all we... Um, eliminate the accumulated depreciation on acquisition date, so 15,000, similar to the approach to revalue an asset in a company where we eliminate the accumulated depreciation and then adjust the cost of the asset to um, so that it reflects the fair value. So in this case the cost of the asset was um, a hundred thousand um, and we had to reduce that to reflect the ninety thousand fair value. Because we um, adjust the 
carrying amount of an asset, it's going to have a deferred tax consequence. So of the $5,000 um, adjustment from the carrying amount to the fair value, 30% on that is the deferred tax liability and the rest goes to equity as the business combination valuation reserve. Okay. The second step is then to account for the, the um, depreciation expense which will be different on a group level than that of flowing through from the subsidiary. Now the depreciation per annum and um, the extra depreciation is there's a $5,000 fair value adjustment and over 10 years it's going to realize through using the asset so that is $500 per annum but because we only pause these entries on consolidation and never in the accounting records of the subsidiary we also have to adjust for the depreciation since the acquisition date. So we're now busy with year 5. So we're going to have an adjustment to our opening retained earnings of 4 years times $500 a year. So that's $2,000. For the current year, we also have to increase our depreciation expense to get it in line with what it should be from a group level and we credit our accumulated depreciation 2500 okay so as you can see here our retained earnings opening balance is adjusted with the extra depreciation for years 1 to four. This is for year five, the current year that we're busy with. As this depreciation expense entry is passed, we then need to um, consider the reversal of the deferred tax as we use that asset. So the deferred tax liability, debit deferred tax liability, um, with 750 credit our retained earnings opening balance by 600 so it's the tax effect on that entry and it goes against our opening retained earnings because it relates to an adjustment to earnings in prior years and then for the current year it goes to income tax expense it back here 150. Okay, so that covers the BCVR entries for plant and machinery as at 30th and um, 31st of December 2009. There's another BCVR entry that we need to pause, and that relates to the goodwill that was acquired as part of the business combination. So remember that the goodwill is only raised on consolidation. It is an asset. So we debit the goodwill, 11500 and we credit the BCVR of 11500 So the total BCVR, it's 11500 plus relating to the goodwill, plus three and a half relating to the plant and machinery. What's that? 15,000. Yes. Okay. So, in this question, two items that needs to be considered with uh, BCVR entries. The depreciable asset, which consists of three sets of um, adjustments. The valuation, the depreciation, the tax, and then the goodwill that we create on consolidation um, 
in this case of 11,500. The second step is then to do the pre-acquisition entries. Okay, so what does the pre-acquisition entries relate to? The purpose of these entries is to eliminate the parent share of the subsidiary's equity and we eliminate it against the investment in subsidiary that's lying in the accounting records and the balance sheet of the parent company. The reason why we have to eliminate it is that we incorporate the assets and the liabilities of the subsidiary at fair value into the combined results. The line item investment in subsidiary already reflects the parent company's share of the net assets of the subsidiary. So if we bring in the total assets and liability of the subsidiary as well as include that investment in subsidiary, we will double account for the group assets and equity. So therefore we have to eliminate the subsidiary's equity, the parent share of the subsidiary's equity against the investment in the subsidiary. Now we, um, it's not always asked to, um, or required of you to prepare the initial entry on the acquisition date. But I refer to this entry as your basis journal or your basis entry and you need it because in subsequent years you're going to use this basis entry and just adjust it for any events that affects pre-acquisition equity. So in this question what do we have to eliminate? We eliminate the equity of the subsidiary so the retained earnings on acquisition date of 20,000 the share capital of the subsidiary of $100,000, the general reserve on acquisition of $25,000, and the business combination valuation reserve that we've now created through our BCVR entries because that forms part of the equity of the subsidiary even though it's not recorded per se in the subsidiary's equity it relates to the revaluation of the subsidiary's assets and liabilities. So it forms part of the subsidiary's equity on consolidation. And we eliminate that against the shares in the subsidiary of $160,000. So if we incorporate this entry in the consolidation worksheet, the, it will fully eliminate the retained earnings, share capital, general reserve and the BCVR um, from the subsidiary. So this is, as I said, the basis journal. We are now five years down the line and we need to consider what happened in this period that relates to pre-acquisition equity and therefore need to be adjusted against these amounts. Now, the only thing that happened in this question is that the general reserve was reduced to pay for unpaid shares, so it increased the share capital. So on the 31st of December 2014, the entry would look like this. Debit retained earnings, $20,000 because it's the retained earnings at acquisition date. Debit our share capital of the subsidiary. Debit the general reserve. So you can see that $20,000 that was transferred to share capital. Debit your business combination valuation reserve. Credit your investment in subsidiary. Okay, so actually a, pl a pretty straightforward pre-acquisition entry that needs to be paused. 
if you have um, a non-controlling interest um, in the group structure, so the parent company does not own 100% of the shares, this is the stage then where you will start calculating the non-controlling interest um, share of the subsidiary's equity. But in this example, it wasn't applicable and we only have to carry on to eliminate intergroup transactions. So it's intergroup transactions and balance. Okay. Now the purpose of these consolidation entries is to eliminate our intergroup. I hope you can read that. Is to eliminate any unrealized profits on transactions between groups within the or entities within the group of financial or of companies. Now the reason why we eliminate that is because our consolidated financial statements should only reflect the results of dealings with external parties. So in this question, if we refer to the additional information, we see that there are a number of intergroup transactions. First of all, inventory was sold by the parent company to the subsidiary um okay yes so the inventory was transferred from the parent company to the subsidiary in the current period and half of this inventory was sold at the end of the financial year so half of the inventory that was transferred between the parent and subsidiary during the year has realized during the year and that will flow through from the parents' accounting records, that profit. But half of it, there's profit flowing through from the parents' um, accounting records, which from a group perspective has not realized yet. So from a group perspective, that sales of inventory did not occur. And we have to re, um, reverse that entry. So um, it's a standard entry if your inventory is in the ending, um, your unrealized profit sits in the ending inventory. What you do is you debit your sales, so reduce or eliminate the intergroup sales. You credit cost of sales, so you reduce the cost of sales on a group level. Um, to eliminate the cost of sales that is recorded in the company that transferred the inventory. And we reduce the inventory balance with that unrealized profit that sits in the inventory balance. Because we um, adjust the carrying amount of an asset, of course there will be a deferred tax implication so we debit deferred tax asset and um, credit our income tax expense with the movement in the deferred tax okay so this is a standard entry that is applicable for all scenarios where inventory was transferred during the year and all or part of the inventory is still on hand at the end of the financial year. So in this question, they told us that um, during the current period, Laura sold inventory to Jade for $20,000. So we eliminate all the sales, $20,000. This had originally cost Laura $18,000. 200 okay so let's just put that in brackets here now the cost of sales was 18,000 
two hundred. So there was an unrealized profit for the group initially of um one thousand eight hundred dollars. We which we would have adjusted against inventory. But now half of the inventory has realized. So half of the eighteen thousand uh, dollars one thousand eight hundred dollars has realized. So our cost of sales increases by the nine hundred and um the inventory needs to be adjusted with only the unrealized profit still sitting in the inventory. So eighteen two hundred plus nine hundred is nineteen one hundred. So initially the unrealized profit um of one thousand eight hundred was reversed by this entry, but because half of that inventory has realized half of the um unrealized profit has realized so it's the um adjustment for the unrealized profit is not four thousand eight hundred anymore but now only for nine hundred dollars which is the net effect of the twenty and the nineteen one hundred. Okay, so it reflects the fact that it's not the full one thousand eight hundred that's unrealized profit anymore, but only nine hundred dollars now. Okay. Because we adjust the um inventory by nine hundred dollars, the deferred tax asset um that's created on that is two seventy with the movement going to the income tax expense. So that's the one intergroup transaction in this question. The second is where inventory is um transferred in the group and it becomes machinery in the next company. So in the year when this transfer occur, occurred, um, in the company that carried it as inventory, um, the accounts affected would have been sales and cost of sales. And the unrealized profit would sit in machinery. Now from a group perspective, what's happened? It's not a case of inventory that was sold at a profit um and machinery were purchased by another company from a group perspective they say that the um it's merely an asset inventory that has been reclassified as machinery at the same cost so therefore the profit in the company that recorded the sales transaction needs to be reversed. But this entry occurred not in the current year, but in 2011, if I remember correctly. Um, on the 1st July 2011. So this adjustment will, in the current year will not be against sales and cost of sales, but against retained earnings opening balance. Um, and the, this adjustment, of course, will be after tax. The, un, the unrealized profit um, in this case is 7500 calculated as the difference between the selling price in the company that sold the machinery less the cost to manufacture it, 17500 So it's $7,500 that needs to be adjusted. So the entry in the current year will then be debit retained earnings opening balance five two five zero debit our deferred tax asset two two five zero and we reduce the plant and machinery with the unrealized profit. 
that sits in planted machinery. Because the value of our plant and machinery is adjusted, so it's reduced on a group level, it means that the depreciation flowing through from the subsidiary is going to be too high and we need to adjust for the depreciation. So um, the asset is depreciated at 10% per annum and um, we've the transfer happened three and a half years ago so our entry is going to be debit accumulated depreciation credit retained earnings opening balance for the two and a half the first two and a half years comes to an amount of one eight seven five credit our depreciation expense for the current year so that's for one year of seven hundred and fifty and the adjustment to accumulated depreciation 2625. So as you can see, um, because we're crediting our depreciation expense, we're reducing the depreciation expense on a group level as opposed to what was flowing through from the subsidiaries account or the parent company who ever sold the, the inventory. Okay, and then the third um, um, component to this, this item is to reverse the tax as the asset realises and the realisation of the asset is reflected in our depreciation charge. So as we adjust the depreciation, the tax also needs to be reversed. So we um, debit our income tax expense with 225 which is the tax effect of the current year's um, depreciation we debit our retained earnings opening balance with 563 which is the tax effect of the depreciation in prior years and Come on, we, address, we adjust it against the deferred tax asset. We reverse that deferred tax asset of 788. Okay, so inventory transferred to machinery has three components to it. The adjustment of the unrealized profit um, in the assets um at the the date of the consolidation worksheet so we reverse the portion of the unrealized profit that still sits there the corresponding depreciation adjustment and the tax effect on that it's the third component the last intergroup transaction um, related to sale of machinery The um, selling price of the machinery was $50,000, sold by Jay to Laura, and the, uh, it had a carrying amount of $55,000. So when this transaction was recorded in prior financial period against the, um, uh, sorry, in the current financial year, um the Jade would have recorded a loss of five thousand dollars in their accounting records. But now remember from the group perspective no loss was suffered, selling price was not recorded, and this machinery actually still had a carrying amount of fifty five thousand dollars. But what would flow through from the accounting records is the machinery valued at $50,000 with a loss in the income statement. So we need to reverse that to get back to the scenario. So how would we do that? We'll debit 
plant and machinery to increase um, the the cost of fifty thousand dollars back to the value of fifty five and we reverse that loss on sale so we credit the loss on sale of asset by five thousand dollars we also reverse the tax effect on that so debit income tax expense one thousand five hundred credit deferred tax asset okay so as we adjust the carrying amount of an asset we record the movement in the deferred tax the um, other leg to this entry is the fact that the depreciation in the accounting records would be based on fifty thousand dollars from a group perspective the depreciation should have been based on a carrying amount of $55,000. So therefore we need to increase the depreciation expense flowing through from the, um, the accounting records of Jade so that it reflects a depreciation expense based on a value of $55,000. So we need to increase our depreciation expense by $250 per annum and our accumulated depreciation and through that extra depreciation expense our deferred tax is reversed $75 and credit our income tax expense $75 okay so those two going together and those two okay so that covers our intergroup transactions the last adjustment then just relates to the dividend. Our consolidated financial statement should only, with regards to dividends, this, um, include the dividends that is paid to or payable to external parties. So any dividends paid to the parent company and recorded by the parent company needs to be reversed. So in this question we had to debit dividend payable, $8,000, credit our dividend declared, debit what was recorded in the parent company as dividend revenue of 8000 and the receivable raised by them, 8000 Now you might say that this entry has absolutely no effect on the basis, um, the bottom line profit, and you're right, because the expense um, would net off against the income. But if we don't reverse these entries, on a line item, our dividend declared, um, our creditors would be... Um, sorry, our expense would be overstated, our dividend revenue would be overstated, our debtors would be overstated as well as our creditors. So we, even though it's got a net, no effect on the bottom profit figure, it, we need to eliminate these entries. Okay, so that was a, quite an in-depth um, review of a consolidation question. Um, if you need any further explanation, please feel free to post questions on my guru.